Good afternoon. I'm Raleigh Flynn. I'm the president of the Foreign Policy Research Institute. Uh, we are a nonpartisan think tank based in Philadelphia, and we're very, very pleased this afternoon to have an extraordinary um, uh, speaker and an extraordinary American, uh, former Ambassador Ryan Crocker, talking about Afghanistan. I can think of no one better qualified to talk not only about Afghanistan, but of the region. Our host this afternoon will be Dr. John Noggle, who is currently a visiting professor of national security studies at the US Army War College. He's also a retired Lieutenant Colonel in the US Army and was on the team that produced the US Army Marine Corps Counterinsurgency Field Manual. He's also the author of Learning to Eat Soup with a Knife, uh, Counterinsurgency Lessons from Malaya and Vietnam. And I'm also obliged to give a disclaimer, any views that Dr. Noggle expresses are his own personal views and do not reflect the views of the US government, the US Army, or the US Army War College. I should probably say do not necessarily reflect the same views. Um, I would also like to say thank you to our mainline sponsors, uh, Eileen Rosenau, James Gately, and John Piasecki, as well as to our supporters and partners and trustees who may be in the audience. Uh, thank you for all the support you give us. We could not do this without you. Uh, finally, if you have questions throughout the briefing, please put them in the Q&A, ideally in the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen, not the chat, although we tend to check the chat too, just in case. So without further ado, I'll turn it over to John Noggle. Thank you, Raleigh, very much. And ladies and gentlemen, welcome to this first mainline briefing for this year. I am absolutely delighted to welcome Ambassador Ryan Crocker to get us started. Ambassador Crocker was a career ambassador with the US Foreign Service for 37 years. And after retiring, he was called back on active duty by President Obama to return to Afghanistan in 2011 for a second tour as ambassador there. He had previously been the US ambassador to Syria, Iraq, Pakistan, Kuwait, and Lebanon. As a result of his extraordinary service to our nation, Ryan Crocker has received many of the nation's highest awards, including the highest award the executive branch can bestow upon anyone, the Presidential Medal of Freedom. I will not run through all of his many awards, uh, except to say, if I may, as a former soldier, uh, that I would guess that one of the ones of which he is most proud is that upon his uh, departure from Kabul the second time as ambassador there, he was made an honorary Marine by the United States Marine Corps, an extraordinary gesture of respect from that service. I'm gonna ask the ambassador some questions for perhaps 30 minutes and then ask him your questions, which as Raleigh said, you can put in the Q&A. Uh, but as I'm going, if your questions are better than the ones I'd plan to ask, I'm just gonna go ahead and go right to yours. I may and may not give you credit as we go, uh, but so don't hesitate to put your questions in. You can start them now. Uh, but I'm going to get the very first one. And what I'm going to ask Ambassador Crocker is for his assessment of the new government in Kabul. Well, thanks for having me, John. Um, very, very happy to do this and at this particular moment in time. Um, well, the, uh, the new government looks um, remarkably like the old government. Um, the band is back. Uh, the, the guys who were running the show in the 90s are uh, now looks like they're in a position to run the show again. Uh, it would come as no surprise that all of them are male. Uh, come as no surprise that almost all of them um, are um, uh, ethnic Pashtun and Sunnis. Uh, you're, you're not, for example, going to see a Shia Hazara uh, in this or any other cabinet they may put together. Uh, having done some pretty brutal things during their last occupation. The uh, appointment of Sirajuddin Haqqani in particular is, uh, uh, I think, important to focus on. He was uh, not in the last uh, cabinet. Um, his father was at one time. Uh, Sirajuddin now runs the notorious um, uh, Haqqani network, network that had been based in Pakistan's North Waziristan. Uh, so all in all, uh, this Taliban 2.0, as some have characterized it, 
um, they are not, in fact, kinder and gentler than the previous government, again, because many of them were the previous government. And I don't think their two decades in exile uh, have um, made them any better disposed to women, minorities, um, or Americans. Thank you for that cheery uh, beginning of our discussion, Mr. Ambassador. Staying with cheery topics for the start, uh, what is your thinking on the uh, departure of American forces from the region and the departure of the United States from the region, both the, the plan and the execution? Well, uh, this has been the um, policy implementation from hell. Uh, I guess you could say there is good news, which is that um, President Trump and President Biden, who would agree on virtually nothing, uh, have agreed on a major national security issue for the United States. The bad news is uh, they, they both got it dead wrong. Uh, and that was the decision to effectively negotiate a, an American surrender uh, uh, with the Taliban uh, and without the Afghan government in the room. Uh, the Taliban had long set that as a precondition happy to talk to you Americans, but we're not gonna to talk to your puppets. Uh, so, you know, just by announcing these talks, uh, President Trump made it clear what was going on here. Uh, a, a discussion of surrender terms for the United States and, and our final withdrawal. Uh, and it began a painful delegitimization and demoralization of the Afghan government and its security forces that reached culmination, of course, uh, uh, in, in August. And so bad policy, worse implementation. Um, uh, we've all got, I think, seared into our memories, those awful scenes from the, uh, the 16th of August when um, uh, a mob basically uh, uh, overran the airport perimeter and were chasing a C-17 down the runway. Uh, uh, several of them, um, uh, managed to get a foothold and handhold and um, took off with the plane. And we saw the appalling sight of at least two of them then falling to their deaths, reminding me 20 years on of some of those awful uh, photos we saw of the World Trade Center with uh, uh, individuals jumping to, to die that way rather than uh, uh, die in the flames. So, um, Again, it's, it's hard to imagine how implementation could have been worse than it was. And, uh, you, you mentioned, John, the uh, status I have as an honorary Marine. Yes, you're right. I am extremely proud of that. It was not handed out uh, frequently or easily. Uh, looking at what happened to the Marines, of course, in Kabul airports and, and looking at some of the, uh, the photographs, uh, uh, they were put out there um, you know, really on point. Um, there was nothing between them and the crowd. Uh, you know, there was no forward perimeter. Uh, they were the forward perimeter, perimeter uh, and uh, a very easy target for Islamic State, of course. And we lost those uh, <clears throat> 11 Marines, their, uh, their Navy medic, and uh, one trooper from the 82nd. Uh, uh, and for me, again, good Lord, you, you, uh, it brought me right back to Beirut, 1983, when, as you, you may recall, the Marines were given a, an ill-defined mission uh, uh, with no end date set, and were sitting ducks at the uh, Beirut airport uh, for the truck bomb that um, uh, killed just under 250 of them. I, you know, those Marines out there on the front. Uh, they weren't born in 1983. Their parents probably weren't born in 1983, but I can tell you every Marine there knew exactly the, uh, what had happened in Beirut. Uh, they were sent out there to do it again, uh, and they did it in the, in the very finest traditions of their service. Uh, but boy, the, the political uh, leaders who put them in that position, I don't see how they sleep at night. And what was the alternative, Mr. Ambassador? Well, look, it, it would not have been that hard uh, to push out a perimeter 
uh, arrange a, a perimeter, uh, you know, some several hundred meters in front of the Marines. Uh, that was effectively done for their final withdrawal. Uh, uh, that, uh, there, there, there could have been a perimeter established uh, that would have given them a buffer uh, because again, the intelligence was there that Islamic State was coming and uh, uh, very sadly, those Marines knew they were coming for them, but they had a mission to execute and they did it. And the finest traditions of the Corps. Uh, and was there a, a broader alternative to the American decision to withdraw really once President Trump had, had negotiated that agreement with the Taliban? Uh, I, again, I think that uh, we could have gone for a, a staged implementation uh, no, uh, you know, this that sudden pulling of the ripcord, um, you know, could have been avoided, certainly. Um, you know, and I am reliably informed that President Biden had that advice. It, it doesn't need to be like this. Uh, you know, uh, it, we're all caught up, I think, in the, uh, again, those awful images and, and see the whole thing as a fiasco, which uh, in, in many respects it was, but it, your, um, your, not only your, your heart, your appreciation has to go out to the uh, Marines and soldiers who carried out that mission. I mean, uh, bringing in that number of forces that quickly, um, setting up a perimeter and then doing the, the right thing to uh, try to process some of these people through. Uh, is totally amazing and equally amazing, I think, were the, was the work of the uh, Foreign Service officers uh, out there at the airport in uh, setting up some, pre some, some screening criteria that made sense uh, and uh, uh, getting panicked Afghans on planes and, and out. Uh, they, they, all of them, military and civilians on site, performed with, with enormous courage, creativity and dedication. So we just need to be careful in our criticisms. And I, I am proud to lead the March of the Critics. Uh, 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 that absolutely does not apply to, to those who had to execute that flawed mission. And sir, is it your opinion that we could have stayed longer in Afghanistan, not just executed the phased withdrawal you just spoke to, uh, but maintain an American presence there over a longer period of time? Uh, perhaps, as Larry Holman asks, uh, in order to uh, provide more instruction in democracy, uh, more experience of living in freedom to the people of that poor country. Well, look, um, John, as you know, I, I was ambassador 2011-2012 for the surge there in Afghanistan. It brought us up uh, above 100,000 troops. Uh, you know, we had to deal with uh, uh, Taliban attacks, of course, but the Taliban controlled not a single one of Afghanistan's 34 provinces. Um, and as we steadily drew our numbers down, the, that dynamic persisted. So that when President Biden left office uh, uh, with about 15,000 troops deployed, the Taliban still couldn't take and hold a single provincial capital. Uh, in, in early 2017. Yep, exactly. Uh, so uh, what we had effectively done was uh, working with the Afghan government and security forces uh, uh, created a very inexpensive insurance policy for ourselves. Uh, the, the loss of blood and treasure was minimal. Uh, uh, those of us, uh, and again, I, and I know you you teach your students this at the war college every single day you're in class. Uh, you know, words like victory don't obtain in situations like Afghanistan anymore. And the last total victory we, we had was World War II, one could say. Um, so these issues have to be managed. Um, uh, there is not that magical moment when you can say we've won the war for all time and it's done. Well, it wasn't going to be done, but Unlike Iraq, we had a very clear mission in Afghanistan, which was to prevent uh, Afghan soil ever again being used for an attack on the homeland. Uh, uh, 
you know, no question in my mind, whether it was when I opened the embassy uh, after just a few days after New Year's 2002, or when I was there as ambassador, or indeed today, no confusion in my mind what the mission was all about. It was our security <laughs> and the security of our homeland, because, you know, this is not theoretical. Uh, it, it, it was Al-Qaeda under Taliban cover in Afghanistan that had the, the time and the space and the security to put together the 9-11 uh, uh, attacks. So, uh, <coughs> sorry, the band is back. Um, again, not theoretical. Uh, these are the guys that were there uh, during that seminal period. Um, and um, uh, we have to consider that um, uh, they're, they're going to have the same mindsets uh, going forward. So we've degraded our own security. Uh, we've compromised our values. You know, we, uh, we said, for example, to Afghan girls and women, get an education, run for parliament, uh, start a business, join the military, we got your backs. And they did, I mean, they did step forward. 22% of parliamentary deputies female. Uh, I think a higher percentage than the US Congress, if I'm correct. <laughs> that would be correct. I think we offer around 19%. Uh, uh, so, boy, they, they, um, they took that offer, and then we decided we're just tired. We don't want to do it anymore. Um, uh, goodbye and good luck. So uh, it's, a, it's a pretty, pretty sad time, and it's also a pretty scary time, frankly. Uh, uh, this, uh, this withdrawal, this retreat, uh, and the manner in which it took place has emboldened uh, militants everywhere in the Muslim world. Um, I mean, the Taliban is able to say with some justification that they, they vanquished the infidels clad only in the armor of the one true faith. So <coughs> yeah, this is, a, this is a problem that we're gonna have now for a long time going forward. And what's your assessment of the strength of Al Qaeda today, 20 years, almost 20 years, two days short from 20 years uh, after the attacks of September 11th? And, and um, what are the chances that uh, they're going to find bases to operate from again in this Afghan territory that we just surrendered? Well, you have to assume that's, uh, that's already happening. Uh, and lest we miss the point, of course, uh, uh, an individual responsible for the um, Al Qaeda security apparatus under Osama bin Laden uh, had a well publicized return to Nangarhar in the east. Uh, uh, so they're not um, they're not trying to keep this a secret. You know they are back, uh, and then sadly, unless they decide to televise it, our uh, intel capacity to pick up uh, what may be going on with Al Qaeda. Uh, it is diminished, as CIA Director Bill Burns said. You know, it's, uh, it's a simple fact here. Our intelligence is degraded if we're no longer on the ground. Uh, how many? I, I, it's probably not that many because it doesn't need to be that many. Uh, you know, they didn't have battalions of Al Qaeda there uh, uh, planning 9 11. Uh, you just need a, a, a handful of guys who. Uh, understand how this stuff works and can figure out a way to uh, uh, come after us again. Uh, all they need is the time and the space that a friendly government will provide them as they did before. And we have a, a new threat as well, something called ISIS-K. Can you talk to that at all, Mr. Master? Yes, uh, and again, we, um, uh, we, we, I think we, it's, it's sort of the American way kind of, or the Western way of thinking. We like neatness and organization charts and boxes and, uh, you know, what's the order of battle for ISIS-K and for Al-Qaeda and for the Taliban? Well, they don't really have a recognizable order of battle. Uh, and they don't carry membership cards. Uh, uh, so our capacity to even know exactly what ISIS-K is, uh, I, I would think, uh, has, has never been substantial and, of course, is now even less as uh, uh, we have pulled out all of our assets. So, uh, you know, we're, we're just going to have to see. There is some um, hope, I guess, if that's the right word, that, uh, you know, maybe the uh, Taliban, Al-Qaeda, and Islamic State Khorasan will all kill each other. 
Uh, well, it would be pretty to think so, um, but uh, I'm just not sure how that's going to play out. We're getting a, a series of terrific questions about Pakistan, uh, the whether Pakistan bears any responsibility for uh, the recent success of the Taliban, both both in retaking uh, Kabul, but then also in the Panjir Valley, um, the, the question of uh, whether the Taliban could, could have survived without support from Pakistan. Yeah, it's a great question. I, uh, I served uh, in Pakistan for, uh, as ambassador for three years in the mid 2000s. Um, you know, and uh, the, the value of a longer tour is that, uh, particularly in these societies where personal relationships count, people get to know you, get to be comfortable with you, and you start hearing things that you certainly wouldn't have heard if you were there on a one one year assignment. Uh, so, so here's the uh, Pakistani narrative on the Afghan Taliban. Uh, time I was there, the message was, "Well, we're really glad you're back, and we're especially glad you're back with your economic uh, and security assistance funds." And we are going to tap into that as long as we can, get as much as we can, uh, because we know how it goes with you Americans. That, um, uh, you come, uh, you shake things up, and then you go. That after the decade of the, uh, of the 1980s, when we worked very closely with Pakistan, uh, training the, uh, uh, the Mujahideen, uh, who then in turn defeated the Soviets, uh, we had no tighter relationship than we did with uh, Pakistan at that time until we didn't need them anymore. Uh, when um, the Soviets were defeated, the administration kind of looked around and said, okay, our work here is done. Uh, there's going to be a big old civil war because the only thing that united the Mujahideen factions was a common enemy that was now gone. But the, an Afghan civil war wasn't our business. Uh, so not only did we leave, we stopped getting um, exemptions to the Pressler Amendment, uh, which stipulates that uh, no US government assistance of any kind will be made available to any government that is pursuing a nuclear weapons program. Now, the Pakistanis, like the Indians, have been very open about that. But for the decade in the 80s, the administration got a waiver each year uh, to the restrictions imposed by the Pressler Amendment until we didn't need Pakistan anymore. Um, and then the um, amendment kicked in. So again, in the Pakistani narrative, it was, uh, uh, you know, we went from being the most allied of allies to the most sanctioned of adversaries, literally overnight. All of that, therefore, um, uh, leads to the Pakistani position on the Taliban that I, that I heard later in my assignment there, that uh, we're happy to work with you on Al-Qaeda. Uh, you know, we don't like them either. Uh, but if you think we're going to turn the Afghan Taliban into a mortal enemy to make you happy when we know you're going home sooner or later, uh, well, we can't go home because we actually live here. And we have to live here with the Afghan Taliban. So if you think we're going to make an enemy out of them, you're completely crazy. And it played out, sadly, just as the Pakistanis knew it would. So I would imagine that, you know, there were about 15 minutes of high-fiving in the corridors of power in Rawalpindi and Islamabad. And then the worrying starts. Because, uh, again, our retreat, our evacuation, and the manner in which it was conducted uh, will embolden militants everywhere, not least in Pakistan itself, where they have a problem with the Pakistani Taliban, uh, which aims not at the overthrow of the government in Kabul, but the government in Islamabad. They, like all other militants, uh, have got to be significantly encouraged by what happened in Afghanistan. I'll just give you one more anecdote there. Uh, uh, John, you would know it, of course, but uh, uh, there was a um, intelligence chief uh, of inner services intelligence in the 90s, an officer named Hamid Ghul, uh, who was alive and well still in Rubble Pindi. He was the one who threw in uh, or got the policy 
uh, aligned for Pakistan to support the Taliban in the early 90s because they saw that they had the uh, ability to bring an end to the civil war, which was an existential threat to Pakistan. Uh, so Hamad Ghul is one of those we just love to hate. Um, uh, a uh, nice cushy house on the cantonment in Rawal Pindi. Well, he got quoted uh, a couple of weeks ago when all this was coming apart. And, and here's what he said. He says, you know, um, I've been saying for a long time that ISI <clears throat> defeated the Soviets in Afghanistan with uh, American help. Now I get to say that ISI defeated the Americans in Afghanistan with American help. Uh, and I just think it sums it up exactly. Uh, uh, we did this to ourselves. The Taliban didn't defeat us. Uh, we ran out of patience, uh, decided we were done and that we were gone. Uh, and that's uh, exactly what we're gonna have to deal with now, what Pakistan is gonna have to deal with now, what Iran is gonna have to deal with now, China with its disaffected Uyghur populations, the, former Soviet republics with uh, substantial Muslim population, you name it, the forces of disorder have been emboldened by our, our policy and the uh, clumsiness of its implementation. I've, I've heard Pakistan described as the dog that caught the bus and now has to figure out what to do with it. Uh, let me get you to, to spend just another minute on the situation each of those countries finds itself in now in, in the region. Can I get you to just say a few more words about how great power relations in the Middle East have been affected by this? And I've got a specific question about uh, Saudi Arabia and, and how this affects Saudi Arabia as well. Yes. Um, well, I think everyone is um, uh, recalculating, as it were. Uh, so the Americans left, they left in a shambles, the Taliban is back. Uh, so what does this mean for us? Uh, uh, certainly, again, uh, the, the Pakistanis have got to be very worried. Uh, uh, that it, Kind of shaky at the best of times, uh, they'll see an emboldened Pakistani Taliban, but also an emboldened uh, Kashmiri militancy. Pakistan created those groups uh, at the time of independence to have a way of exerting pressure on India in, in Kashmir, but they lost control of those groups years ago. Well, they're going to be thumping around with uh, uh, a great deal more activity, I fear. Uh, and, uh, you know, when you think of it, Pakistan, 220 million people and nuclear weapons uh, facing a huge threat an existential threat uh, to their internal stability. Uh, Iran, you know, like the Pakistanis, I, they probably had another 15 minutes of high-fiving in time the great Satan takes one in the chops. It's good for them, particularly if that one in the chops was delivered by the great Satan itself. Uh, but, uh, you know, they almost went to war with the Taliban at the end of the 90s. Uh, there really isn't room for a Sunni Islamic emirate uh, on the one hand uh, and a Shia Islamic Republic on the other hand. Uh, so the tactical coordination between Iran and the Taliban, well, I don't think that's going to last very long. And we will be back again to a, uh, the danger of a militancy there. And, you know, we could say, well, what could be wrong with a destabilized Iran? Uh, well, actually a whole lot could if it were to devolve into some kind of civil war. Uh, the Russians have got to worry, uh, certainly uh, as do the Central Asian republics. Let's see how this plays in Chechnya and, and in Dagestan for them. Uh, the Chinese having um, done everything they could to turn their Uyghur Muslim population into a completely disaffected group through their sundry uh, acts of uh, uh, oppression and worse, well, that's pretty fertile ground for uh, another Islamic militancy. And, and again, there's gonna be that schadenfreude on our own part. Uh, well, you know, these bastards deserve it. You know, just, uh, and that may be true. I cheer that on actually, uh, but I'm, I'm just afraid we're gonna be, we are entering now a prolonged period in which the threat of Islamic militancy is much, much higher than it has been. 
uh, with consequences not only for the countries directly involved, but for all of us. Uh, uh, this militancy does not know national boundaries. What happens in Afghanistan doesn't stay in Afghanistan. We saw that already. Uh, so it's going to be a pretty rough ride ahead. That's that's particularly painful coming after 20 years in which we've been more successful than I think we could have hoped at preventing radical Islamic extremism from doing grave damage here inside our borders, uh, which I think many of us expected after those attacks of September 11th. And I'm, I'm reminded when you speak of the role that the United States plays as sort of damping down regional tensions and acting as a buffer and a moderator uh, in East Asia, for instance, a uh, role that, that, um, that even, even as China uh, resents it and, and chafes against it in, in some ways, China, I think, uh, they would never admit this, but appreciates. And the United States is no longer there to play that role of, of moderator and uh, queller of badness um, here in, in, um, in the center of the Islamic world, which is extremely troubling. Um, and and uh, Alexander Lazar asks a question that I think um, many of us are, are wondering. Uh, after this 20 year investment of blood and treasure with, with what appears to be so little to show in return. And I'd ask you to, to, to take that on, right? Uh, what do we have to show for this 20 year investment? That's something I, I go back and forth on. Um, Alexander asks, what, what could we have done to lead to a better outcome? Well, where we, uh, we failed, it wasn't really through uh, any of our direct actions. Uh, it, it was um, our failure of strategic patience. We just, uh, we just decided we didn't want to do it anymore. Uh, that uh, I, I described the trajectory we had been on, uh, our dramatically lower number of troops in Afghanistan, and yet uh, Taliban, the Taliban was uh, still at bay. Uh, I got it all about the corruption and the ghost soldiers and the corrupt commanders. Um, uh, all of it true, sadly, uh, but that has been true for quite a while. Uh, uh, and yet the uh, security forces soldiered on. Uh, and I, I just hate to see this laid at their feet that uh, they wouldn't fight for their country. So why shouldn't we? Uh, uh, you know, that basically what the president of the United States said, and it, it was, um, uh, it, it, uh, was totally unfair and it frankly it degraded the presidency. Uh, you know, at the time I was there, every week there would be a, a ceremony at uh, the International Security Assistance Force uh, headquarters in Kabul. And it would consist of um, the names of the dead, KIA, being read. Uh, sadly, every week there would be at least one American. Coalition partners, less, but there. The last speaker was always an Afghan officer and he didn't read out names. He would just say a number, 133, you know, 127, week after week after week. And yet they stayed in the fight uh, until we decided to, uh, again, uh, delegitimize and demoralize them. Uh, there is one area where I think uh, I, we did make an avoidable mistake. We, uh, we worked to try to create an Afghan security force that looked like us. Um, that would be forward deployed, heavily reliant on air support for everything, um, you know, butter, bullets, medevac, close air support when required. And the only way that would work was through our contractors to the Afghan Air Force. And uh, as we now all know, their contracts were tied to our troop presence. Uh, we go, they go. Uh, so in addition to, uh, again, just the delegitimization of um, the state and its military forces, uh, uh, we left them in a situation where the, the construct no longer worked. They couldn't, uh, they couldn't sustain these garrisons. Uh, you know, and add to that, again, under the Trump time, uh, forcing the government to release 5,000 Taliban prisoners who immediately joined the fight against those security forces. Uh, so it really doesn't surprise me that they, uh, they collapsed as they did. 
um, you know, what were they giving their lives for anymore when it was clear we were walking out? Uh, and they're not dumb. They know their capabilities and they know what, uh, what they need to stay in the field and they weren't going to get it anymore. Uh, so again, um, uh, just a very, very hard time where we, um, with the whole world watching, we demonstrated that we do not wish to lead globally. We don't care what the consequences are. We don't care if the uh, government we have said we would support. Uh, we don't even care about our, uh, our own people in the sense of the uh, special immigrant visa category. Uh, all of those who uh, uh, put their lives at risk and their families' lives at risk by um, uh, working for us. We, we said we would take care of them. Then we pull out and they are thousands of them left behind with their families. So this has not been a great couple of months uh, for America's prestige in the world, for America's leadership role, if we care to exert it, um, uh, and for American values. The, the, the women and girls that uh, we were just talking about, the security forces that, that died by the thousands. Uh, uh, it's, um, we're, we're gonna pay for this for a long time. Our children will pay for it and our children's children will probably pay for it too. I'm reminded of the, the scenes at the end of Charlie Wilson's war, where Charlie Wilson who had done so much to fund uh, the attempt to defeat the Soviet Union in Afghanistan was unable to provide funds to, to secure Afghanistan afterwards and, and right, sort of saw it coming. I, I'd like to stay on the Afghan security forces for a moment, if I, if, if I may. You know them better than I do, but, but um, I, I can tell you that as an American soldier, um, I, I, I never would have been expected to, have, to fight without air cover, without air medevac available. And uh, I think it's asking an awful lot of them after we had trained them and equipped them uh, in that way to expect them to continue to fight even longer than they did. A great question from Mark Kustra, uh, who, who notes that, that we appear to struggle building partner nation security forces and asks, how can we improve on this in the future? Well, in a overly long career uh, in the foreign service, I, I learned maybe two things. Uh, uh, be careful what you get into um, if it involves uh, military action, because you're going to be setting in motion uh, currents and consequences that you can't begin to predict, uh, let alone uh, prepare for. You just can't. Uh, so if you're going in militarily, you've got to be very clear on, on what the mission is uh, and then stick with that. Um, and we're we're not really good at being careful going in. Now, we're talking about Afghanistan, and I think Afghanistan is, is you know, one significant exception. We definitely knew what we were going in to do. And, you know, I opened the um, embassy formally just after New Year's Day, uh, January 02, and I sure knew why I was there. Uh, it was never again. Uh, and if that needed to be double tapped uh, six months after 9-11, uh, we, um, we gathered around the embassy flagpole, a company of Marines who were uh, billeted on the embassy for security, my staff, uh, uh, 5th Special Forces Group, um, uh, then Colonel, later Lieutenant General, John Mulholland, uh, to uh, dedicate a piece of the World Trade Center in the base of the flagpole. Uh, uh, John had brought over you know, a number of pieces that were emplaced around the country. So yeah, we got it. We, we knew why we were there. We had a specific mission. And even with that, we ran out of patience. Uh, uh, we were sure we, we had to keep the premiums up on that insurance policy, but boy, oh boy, it was a hell of a lot cheaper than another 9-11. And uh, yet, yet we still could not muster that um, indispensable load of patience. So be careful what you get into. And this does apply to the second point does apply to Afghanistan, of course, be even more careful about what you get out of. That uh, disengagement can have graver consequences in your initial intervention. And, um, and we, uh, well, <clears throat> to, how can I say it? We certainly screwed that up. Uh, <laughs> uh, this is a family channel, but you get the drift. Uh, 
um, uh, you know, we, uh, we have jeopardized, we have compromised, I think, our values uh, by the way we walked out. Uh, we've compromised our own security uh, through that withdrawal. We're, we're just not going to have the ability to read what's going on in that country uh, as well as we used to. Um, and that, as uh, Bill Burns said to the Senate Intelligence Committee, it's a simple fact. If you're not there, your intelligence is degraded. Mr. Ambassador, I'd like to pick up on your be careful what you get into lesson uh, on a day when I had the privilege of teaching uh, Thucydides and the Sicilian expedition to my students at the Army War College and, and for those who, who aren't as current on their Thucydides. Um, Athens was engaged in one perfectly good war already and decided to open another front uh, distance from unconnected to uh, the war in which it was already engaged. And, and so as I look at mistakes that were made along the way, uh, and I'm, I'm not, not denying the, the ability and the good work you did uh, there in Iraq uh, later on, but I view the decision to invade Iraq in 2003 as perhaps the critical mistake we made during our 20 year engagement in Afghanistan. I'd appreciate your reaction. Yeah, uh, it, it, it's a great point. So uh, Afghanistan done was done with a, an incredible economy of force uh, on our part. When I, when I got there, of course, my initial uh, question was, uh, where are our deployed forces and who's in charge? Well, in early January 2002, we had exactly one regular combat unit in country, and that was a Marine Expeditionary Unit down in the south. So the way they were configured, uh, the battalion landing team is the core, but they probably had you know five, maybe even 6,000 with the air assets and everything else they needed. That was all, that was it. Everything else was uh, uh, special branch types, uh, special operations types, uh, but only that one unit. And it, it happened that I, um, I went down to Camp Lejeune a year or so later to make a presentation to the, uh, actually the company that had supported us. Uh, but I also had the chance to talk to uh, uh, the Marines uh, in a, uh, you know, got a lot of the officers in there to talk about uh, Iraq and Afghanistan. And one of the uh, Marines there, the 06, who had commanded that view in Afghanistan. And what he said is always stuck with me, which was he didn't have to tell his Marines why they were going to Afghanistan. Uh, they knew, and they were more than ready for the fight. Uh, they got it. Uh, and this would have been now late 2002. He said, I don't know what to tell them about Iraq. I mean, they're smart. They know we're going. Uh, but I don't know what to tell them as to why. Uh, and no one ever could answer that question. Uh, so, you know, a distraction, yes, more than a distraction. Um, I was talking to Bob Gates. Uh, um, we had two wars going on and President Obama was ready to go on a third one into Libya. Uh, and uh, as Secretary of Defense, Secretary Gates just said, look, I've already got two wars I'm trying to manage. Could we just at least get one of them out of the way before we had a third? Uh, so yes, uh, you know, if, you, if your troops are going into action, it's a presidential priority by definition, um, uh, as is pulling them out of action. And again, um, I just think we got it deadly wrong uh, across the board there. You know, in, uh, in Iraq, we weren't careful going in. We weren't careful getting out. We knew what we were doing in Afghanistan, um, uh, but then completely botched strategically and tactically our departure. Uh, and uh, of course, uh, in, uh, in, in Libya, it didn't go so well for us either. So, uh, uh, you know, it's, um, uh, this is not a um, this is not an electronic game. It's uh, real lives and real assets. Uh, be careful before you make that decision to enter and to exit. 
and uh, we've got uh, uh, a bunch of folks, as you and I were, were, were talking about uh, before, um, there's a significant number, 75, 80 um, international students who attend the Army War College every year. Uh, Pakistanis, Afghans, um, and uh, some of my friends here have been working very hard uh, to get some of those folks out of the country in the wake of the collapse, believing that they and their families were in immense danger so, and some real anguish uh, on the faces of um, the international students, but also the Americans, uh, many of whom served uh, with, with distinction, with sacrifice in Afghanistan. Can, can you talk to what you know of that sacrifice, what you saw of that sacrifice, and then how are your foreign service comrades taking uh, the recent events and talking about the recent events? Yeah, John, this is really, really hard. I mean, I, I you know, every morning when I open up that electronic mailbox, uh, yeah, I know what's going to be there. Uh, uh, another desperate plea for help to 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 get somebody out, somebody's interpreter. Um, uh, it happened with our own Foreign Service National employees at the embassy. We didn't get all of them out. Uh, and, and it becomes a, a huge burden of personal guilt. And I, I, I carry that myself. Um, you know, the, uh, I guess we always knew we weren't going to stay there forever, but we acted like we were. So, you know, every year, um, uh, the State Department had a program called Recognizing Women of Courage. Uh, every year there were nominees from Afghanistan and uh, in at least two years um, those women were recognized as the uh, uh, the woman of courage of the year well if you're doing that kind of stuff you better be darn sure uh, that since they step forward at your encouragement that you're going to be there to cover their backs and and we weren't and we didn't and I feel that guilt uh, uh, and then in this chaotic mess, uh, we've, through my, um, the NGO I advise, no one left behind, we've been pounding away at the executive branch and on Congress through two administrations now uh, to find a, to streamline a process. Uh, there are 14 complex, painful steps that you got to go through to get an SIV, and it takes three years. Uh, so guess who got left in the lurch? You know, all of those people risked their lives to uh, help us or sending up the flag saying, save me. Uh, and we're not able to do it. And now that we are out completely, of course, the evacuation ended, uh, well, good luck to them. Now, uh, to its credit, and there is very little to the credit of the current administration, in my view, uh, uh, they, they haven't dropped the issue. Uh, and they continue to speak of it publicly and are working with cutteries and others to find ways to bring these folks out. And it's very important that all of us, I think, be sure that um, the heat stays on them uh, to, to fix the problem they created. But you know, it's not gonna be easy. We're not there anymore. Uh, the only way we're gonna get people out now is if uh, the Taliban okay it. And the Taliban are saying, mm, if you don't have the right documents, you don't get to go. Reminds me of Casablanca, remember that? You know, those travel letters that were so critically important and uh, how they'd been stolen from the Nazis and so forth. Well, we're right back to that. This could be Casablanca uh, with the Taliban playing the role of the Nazis, not nearly as efficient. Uh, uh, but uh, to get large numbers of people out, it is only gonna happen if the Taliban will let it happen. And that is a terrible position for us to be in. Uh, and obviously a potentially fatal position for those who trusted us to be in. Although we do have perhaps some leverage over the Taliban, can I, I, I think they're a little bit in the position of a dog who caught, caught the bus as well. Yes, um, and again, this is one thing the administration did do right. They immediately froze uh, Afghan government assets in the Federal Reserve System, and I'm told that's almost $10 billion. Uh, so that buys you a lot of leverage uh, if uh, you have the political will to use it uh, and you have the sense to do what you should have done in the first place, which is try to pull together an international understanding on the Taliban and how they need to be dealt with uh, so that we don't see a whole lot of leakage right from the beginning. 
sadly, our credibility on that score is um, uh, a little bit tarnished since we have been dealing with the Taliban directly for about, <coughs> about two years now. Hard to tell the Chinese they shouldn't um, uh, <laughs> invite a Taliban to tea. Uh, but uh, that's, uh, that's the only way this is going to work. Uh, the Taliban have to see that they're not getting their 10 billion bucks anytime soon unless they modify their behavior. And to have that buttressed by uh, similarly supportive positions from the rest of the world community. Uh, and as I said, that's gonna be a little bit harder to do since uh, we are not exactly seen as the uh, gold standard here in terms of dealings with the Taliban. Uh, my friend, and I believe yours as well, Carter Malkasian, uh, has a new book out on, uh, it's titled Afghanistan a History. It's magisterial in its, its scope and its reach. Uh, but his fundamental thesis is one that I struggle with. And I, I wonder whether you do as well. Uh, Carter argues, and I think this is the, the fundamental point of his book. He may be watching. We can get him to, to defend himself um, if I misstate this. But, but Carter argues that the Taliban were fighting for their God and their country, and that no Afghan government that cooperated with an infidel outsider, to use the Taliban's words, could possibly hope to prevail. Do you agree with that assessment? Uh, I, you know, I, I don't. And Carter, if you're listening, I haven't read it yet, but I will, uh, I will buy it. I'm not going to ask you to send me a free copy. I, I will buy it and read it and uh, be better informed for the process. Uh, again, uh, you know, you just don't get upwards of 70,000 troops to die for their country if they don't believe in it. Um, uh, and uh, again, the, these troopers may not be literate, but they're not stupid. Uh, and they know what they were up against and they knew they were gonna stand a pretty good chance of being wounded or killed. Yet year after year, uh, they were in the fight. They, they didn't give up the fight until we made it perfectly clear we were giving up on them. <coughs> so uh, I, 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 if that's the central thesis, yeah, I, I would challenge that. I, um, I think it was important to get out of the direct combat role as soon as we could. We did that. Uh, to get into an advise and assist. I think it's <laughs> extremely important uh, to get the, um, the big idea right on Afghan National Security Forces. There, as I said, I, I'm afraid we didn't. Uh, uh, what we should have tried to do was create a force that looked a lot like the Taliban, light infantry, you know, highly mobile. Um, but we went another route and obviously it hadn't, hadn't uh, worked too well. But, you know, it, it, frankly, I mean, with the corruption, uh, with the go soldiers, all of that mess, um, the, that, the security forces were soldiering on. And I think would have done that indefinitely if, if we had not pulled the plug on them. Uh, I'm, I'm personally inclined to agree with you on that point. I'm going to uh, uh, right, speak on behalf of uh, uh, some contrary voices, including Pete Mansour, uh, who argue uh, questions uh, whether we should have done less in Afghanistan, whether we should have departed when we destroyed the Taliban regime. We've got uh, Don Cardin's asking whether we should have left after we killed bin Laden. It does appear to me that those are the other possible exit points. What's your opinion on those particular ways to depart? Well, it, these are exactly the kinds of questions that should have been the subject of a national debate. Um, do we stay or do we go? Um, and if we stay in what form to what end, uh, if we go to what set of consequences? And, we just have not been having those kinds of conversations, sadly. Uh, sure, you, you could um, have limited the mission right from the beginning. Uh, it, it's all counterterrorism. That's all we're going to do. Uh, we'll have our bases. We will have nothing to do with the um, development of a stable Afghan economy and society. Uh, I, I would fear, had we done that, we would have found uh, a stronger insurgency sooner because, you know, again, I, I was there in those um, early days to see firsthand the devastation. I mean, there, there was no economy. Um, 
uh, there, there, there wasn't much of anything anywhere. And, and I think had we not done anything to better the uh, situation for, for Afghans, tele, the Taliban would have had a very large recruiting base very early. Uh, uh, with respect to bin Laden, uh, we, um, the reason it was so hard to find and, and kill him was because he wasn't really operational anymore. Uh, uh, you know, they knew that if he was up on any kind of net or working with regular couriers, we were going to find him. Uh, so it was symbolically hugely important that we do that. But in terms of uh, uh, seriously degrading Al Qaeda capabilities, not so much. They'd already adjusted for that. So those would seem to me to be false inflection points but definitely worth the national conversation that we simply didn't have. Uh, for the last question, the, the time has flown and we're all grateful, uh, but I'm, I'm gonna give David Sedney uh, a, a moment. Uh, I know he's an old friend of, of yours and I'm a, a longtime admirer of that old Afghan hand, but David asked what I consider to be a very sad question. He says, does the American ambivalence we've been discussing about a long-term commitment undermine any ambitions for the U.S. to play a major global role in the future? Should we stop doing things that seem inevitably to lead ultimately to tragedy? Should we aim only to be a small player on the globe? Well, uh, a, a very poignant question coming from someone who has uh, given so much of his considerable ability uh, at considerable risk uh, to a better Afghanistan. Uh, including the American University of Afghanistan. So uh, it, it's, it's wrenching. Uh, look, uh, as I said earlier, the world doesn't run by itself. It's, the danger is not that the Chinese are gonna take over our role, it's that no one can or will. Uh, it's us or it's gonna be a reversion to some kind of balance of power world. Um, and we kind of saw in the first half of the last century what the problem is with balance of power. When it gets imbalanced, it can get very bad as two world wars and a holocaust in the first 50 years of the century made, I think, very, very clear. Uh, so if I were giving advice to the administration, and you know, by the way, I, I'm not really on speaking terms with this administration anymore. I was not on speaking terms with the last administration. Uh, uh, and given the differences between them, that's no small achievement. Uh, but if I were giving advice, I would say assert that global leadership that you so badly tarnished in Afghanistan. Uh, two things immediately come to mind. One of them you hinted at, uh, find a way back into uh, the Trans-Pacific Partnership. Uh, you know, that, that was an own goal of huge negative consequence for us when Trump pulled us out of that. Uh, get back into it. Uh, yeah, I remember uh, uh, a former uh, Seventh Fleet commander, who I won't name, um, saying at the Sedona Forum, one of John McCain's last, uh, uh, Senator McCain asked him if uh, it was true that he had said the TPP was worth a carrier battle group vis-a-vis uh, -vis China. And uh, the um, officer said, no, that is incorrect. I said it was worth two carrier battle groups. Uh, so go global uh, in East Asia. Second thing, lead a truly international effective effort on COVID. Uh, you know, the world inequalities have been amplified hugely with the poorer countries. I mean, almost none of their populations vaccinated. Uh, we could do this. Uh, we would have to get our own stuff straightened out first, a little more than it is. We could do that. Right? We need to find ways to uh, reassert U.S. leadership globally uh, in ways that will be seen as beneficial by all concerned. And we need to kind of do that starting right now because we have dug ourselves an eight foot hole. Well, Mr. Ambassador, um, thank you for that, that call to action and for an America that continues to lead, uh, which I for one uh, wholeheartedly endorse. Uh, on behalf of the entire Foreign Policy Research Institute, our president, Raleigh Flynn, who herself has done great service to our nation. From the bottom of my heart, thank you for all you've done for our nation. Thank you for continuing to be a conscience as America struggles through a very difficult time. But like you, I believe that there is still great good the United States can do in the world and that only the United States can do in the world. And, and you've been an exemplar of that for many, many years. So thank you, sir, very much.